we do. And we do honor you and Pastor Andrea because y'all are there in the midst, in the thick of things with us. And this is a very special day to appreciate. We, we love you and appreciate you every day. But this is, we set aside this day just for y'all. I'm uh, very honored to be able to do this here. And uh, I think about you guys all the time. I have some friends who have four children. Two of them have left and went to college this year. And if you cannot appreciate having this many kids, just go down here this afternoon and buy lunch for you and yours. And imagine having five kids. <laughs> that some of them don't eat off the kids' menu anymore. So, <laughs> I mean, it could take half a paycheck sometimes to uh, to go out to eat to a really nice place. So, not only does I believe this church love you two, it loves your kids. You know, you guys have helped make Pastor Tony and Pastor Andrea who they are as children. You've made them uh, make decisions that they wouldn't have made if you weren't in their life. That's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. They're moms and dads. They're friends and their pastors not in any specific order but I'm very I, I mean I'm I know Tony pretty well and uh, we'll be running and in the middle of all of our running he says wait a minute I've got to go get my kid but he calls him by name you know and it's never been a downer for him it's never been something that he felt like that he had to go do because you know it's not babysitting when you're a parent. It's called responsibility. It's called being a dad. And I appreciate that in both of you. And uh, so, Father God, I, I bless this family in Jesus' name. Lord, we honor them and we lift them up to you. And we know that anything we give to you, you bless and you give back to us. And it's even better. So we give them to you and we thank you for blessing them. I pray for revelation in their life. I pray, I pray for relationship to be stronger between themselves and those that they're close to. I pray that this church is set on fire by the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. I pray, Father God, that, that you send them away, just the two of them, to a place where they can just look each other in the eye and be together. I pray for divine covenant to be stronger than it's ever been. And I pray, Father God, that as we in this church look to Pastor Tony and Pastor Andrea for, for leadership and being led throughout our Christian walk and life together, I pray, Father God, that you would put the words in their hearts and in their lives to release to us. Give them the vision that it takes to raise a church on the move. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words and the, your testimonies on the on the cardboard. You know, that's the the best thing that I have. The favorite thing that I have to do around here is um, watch what Holy Spirit has to do in the lives of people that I come in contact with. So it's very humbling and um, exciting and encouraging to see all the testimonies that are on the cardboard. To just know that uh, what you're doing matters. And what you're doing is uh, in the lives of people is important. And so thank you for that. And I appreciate it and I enjoy it and love it. And glad that my children get to see that because they get to be, he be here a lot and um, see, you know, what, what Holy Spirit is doing in the lives of people that are around. Um, I have some announcements. First of all, we have adult classes that meet every Sunday morning at 9 and so come and be a part of those here on Sunday mornings. Also, life groups happen at 5. Are we having those tonight, even though we have potluck? Do we do both? Okay. Um, so at 5, we have uh, life groups. That one happens here at the church, and then one happens at Miss Shirley's, waving in the back. And then the youth come and meet at our house. So be, make sure you come out and be a part of life groups. Those are fun. And also, Wednesday night service, we have our service that starts at 7. And uh, Batesville Healing Rooms meets here on Friday nights at 6 for training and prayer. 
And then after service, we've already said this, we have a potluck. So there's yummy food. If you didn't bring anything, please stay. There's all, we always have a ton of extra food, so don't, don't feel obligated or bad that you didn't bring anything or anything like that. Please stay if you're visiting with us. That way we can get to know you, and we don't have all the leftovers to take home and, and um, wonder what we're going to do with the rest of the week. And then also King's Pantry. Um, if you we're run, we're maybe running a little low on some food and stuff for the holidays, holiday season's coming up. A lot of people are looking for stuff. So if you can bring uh, food for holiday meals, we would like to pass out meal boxes for families so that they can celebrate Jesus' birthday in style. So if you can um, help us with that, um, Rice Depot gives us some stuff, but you know we're limited to what they they bring us. And so if you have some holiday when you're out doing some holiday shopping, if you could bring some too. We'd appreciate it. And with that, I'm going to dismiss the kids. And we're going to go upstairs. I wanted to, uh, while, while I travel, uh, I pray, just like you do, and I, I try to listen to the Spirit of the Lord, because I really believe, according to John 10, I think it's verse 27, it says, my sheep know my voice, the voice of a stranger they will not follow. So I believe that God is always talking, just like in this room right now, it's filled with radio frequencies, we can't hear any of them because we don't have the right equipment. If we had a radio receiver, we could listen to all kinds of voices, all kinds of sounds would be fill this room. So I believe that at Christian people, we've got a, a certain opportunity and, and maybe even a responsibility to tune our ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. Because I really believe God's talking, and I, and I really believe we do hear God, but sometimes I don't think we rightly recognize His voice. And so I want to share a message with you today that I really believe the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me while I was traveling, and I was driving uh, actually down to Mariana, and I always want to say Georgia, I guess because of Marietta. There's a Marietta, Georgia, and there's a Mariana, Arkansas. But anyway, uh, we're going to Mariana to watch my son uh, play football, and they won their game, so that's good. And uh, we needed a win, amen? And uh, it's always nice to win a ball game. But anyway, on the way down there, I noticed that there were some cotton fields. And as I looked to the right, and I looked to the left, and I kind of even got down low so I could see the, through the thicket. It, it was almost solid white. And as, and as I uh, saw those cotton fields, I even saw trucks going by filled with bales of cotton. So I knew somewhere these, these farmers were harvesting this cotton. It was, it was white. It was ready to be harvested. And obviously from that, I began to think about the truth of God's word where Jesus Christ said, the fields are white unto harvest. And I began to think about what Jesus said and how that uh, meant something to him and what that means to us today. And I think you can see that passage of Scripture in John 4.35. just want to reference that for you. And he tells his disciples that the fields are white unto harvest. Now, when you think about a field being white unto harvest, what, why is that significant? Well, it's significant because, I, and, and let me just give you a quick disclaimer, I am not a farmer. I'm, I'm, I'm almost a gardener, but not, not really. I've got some fruit trees that produce some fruit every now and then, and every now and then I'll try to do a garden, and it never works, you know. So let me just give you a quick disclaimer. Some of the things I'm going to tell you, I really don't know what I'm talking about from experience. But I do know, by theory, if, if I was going to have a 40-acre plot of ground, and I was going to have a harvest, I would need to do some things first. I would need to till the soil which would require heavy equipment or animals or different things depending on what, you know, what level of society we're in when we're doing our farming. I would need to disc that soil. I would need to, to prepare that soil. I would maybe need to augment it with fertilizers and different things. I would need, I would need to then plant the crops in, in, a, in a certain order, in a certain way, and then I would have to be careful that, that I pulled all the weeds and got the weeds out so they're not stealing the life from my crop. I would have to actually probably irrigate this field and, and put water to the field. And, and all of this is for the purpose of the harvest. So Jesus told his disciples 
the fields are white unto harvest. He didn't say the fields need you to get out there and start plowing. He didn't say the, you need to get out there and start disking. He didn't say you need to get out there and start planting. He said the fields are white. So to me what this means is the hard work has already been done. Now I do have some grapes. And I grow grapes in my yard. I've got a, three or four plants that are, that are producing Concord grapes. And I like to just eat them right off the vine. No, I'm not drinking wine. I know everyone's going to wonder. Is he drinking wine? What's he doing? No, I'm not making wine. I'm just eating grapes. I like grapes. Okay, they're good for you. And they taste good. But uh, grapes are so easy, the hardest part really is harvesting. Because they just sit there year after year. You have to mow the grass around them and all that. So it's, it's great. But uh, anyway, I'm excited that the heavy work has been done. And that all I really have to do is pick the crops. And harvest the crops. It seems so easy in the grand scheme of this farming analogy that Jesus is giving us. How many of you think this sounds pretty good? You know, when I worked at Teen Challenge... I, was, uh, I, I had the role of a Teen Challenge staff member, and when I was a Teen Challenge staff member, I was somewhat of a glorified migrant worker. And so what we would do is we would go into the apple fields and we would pick apples. And me being the numbers person that I can be at times, I began to think about what each apple was worth. And so you'd get $10 for a bin. You know, the, the, not us, but the Teen Challenge Center would get paid $10 to fill a bin on a tractor. It was kind of like a little train thing. For those of you that have never been in an apple field picking apples, some of you probably done that. You got an apple bag and got the whole thing going on. You're picking these apples. You're hanging up in a tree. The students were hilarious. You know, we'd always have a lot of fun with them. But anyway, we're picking apples, and I'm thinking each apple's worth one to three cents a piece. And I'm thinking, man, that's pretty cool. If you really think about it, when you're picking apples, it's kind of like picking money off a tree. It's just not a lot of money. You know, it's one to three cents per apple. So you're picking, 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 just putting money in that bag. I think, man, somebody had to plant these trees, somebody had to prune these trees, somebody has to spray these trees, somebody has to, and we're just, we're just picking them, man. This is great. This is the grand finale. So the fields are white. The scripture goes on to say in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, that now is the day of salvation. So when you think about this, I want you to think about sometimes, and we're going to get into this in a little more detail, sometimes we can create self-imposed excuses in our own minds to prohibit us from sharing our faith. And we're going to get into some more detail, but I want to just kind of blow one of these excuses out of the water. How many of you know that sometimes people aren't ready? You know, you can share your faith and they just reject. But if you don't share, you're not going to know they're not ready. You're going to have to share to find out, hey, they're not ready. And then you can begin to kind of retool and reevaluate your direction and how you're approaching that. So, so, in some ways, everything is ready, and the Lord's really just waiting on us. And I think the Lord might ask us today, you don't want the crops to rot in the field, do you? I mean, think about that. All this work's gone in, and all these people are out there, and they're just going to rot in the field if we don't pick them, if we don't harvest them. In Matthew 9, 37 and 38, Jesus says to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. There's a, there's a deception that can come on people that says everybody's already a Christian. You know where I found out everybody wasn't a Christian? It was in an arena football game in Little Rock. I went to an arena football game in Little Rock, and I went, whoa. There are a lot of people here that do not know the Lord. It's evident by the way they're dressing, the way they're acting, the way they're carrying themselves, and all those kinds of things. It was, you know, the fans. I, mean, I don't know, the players too, maybe, but it was specifically speaking of the fans. So the harvest is plentiful. There are, there are opportunities everywhere in this particular area. There are opportunities at work, opportunities at school, Opportunities, believe it or not, at church. Opportunities in Sunday school. Opportunities, all kinds of different ways that we can begin to do this work of harvesting souls for the Lord. And the Lord specifically tells us to ask the Lord of the harvest. And I believe the Lord of the harvest is Jesus Christ himself. We're to ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. Now, this prayer can sound something like this. Lord, your word says we're supposed to send out laborers, ask you to send out laborers into the harvest field. So Lord, I ask you to send out laborers into the harvest field and send them out, Lord, in Jesus' name. Or it can sound like this. Lord, 
send out laborers into the harvest field and I have a pulse I qualify send me send them and me put me in the mix put me in the equation just like Isaiah prayed Lord send me we want to be we want to pray it that way because I sometimes I believe we pray and we're, we're casting these things to the Lord and sometimes the Lord can say how about you have you considered that oh well I don't know about all that but amen so we are praying for the workers to go into the harvest field and I believe the Spirit of the Lord is saying go to us today now I want to talk to you about the last week we talked about Jesus Christ being a superconductor how do you remember that 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 subject? we're going to talk a little bit more I don't know why but we're getting into some physics and I don't know why but anyway I want to talk to you about the subject of critical mass because I believe that critical mass is a, is a concept or a component that applies to in the area of soul winning. Because I think that there's a, a level of revelation that we can get to where we step out into obedience. And if we don't get to that level, we don't move out. So, so what's critical mass? Well, in the physics world, critical mass is the amount of fissile material needed to sustain nuclear fission. And you see nuclear fission in an atomic explosion. This is just unbridled, it's just this release of atomic power. But you've got to put so much energy to this nuclear material before this explosion will happen. If you don't put enough energy into that material, there will be no explosion. You'll just have a thing that sits there. So I believe that you and I, there has to be something that comes into us that causes us to move. There has to be something that comes into us that motivates us and compels us to action. And I want to talk to you about some of the things that seem to uh, be obstacles that prevent us from from sharing our faith how many of you would just raise your hand real quickly and say pastor I, I like sharing my faith and I share my faith some but I know I could really step it up in this area that's that's me I, I, there's more that I could do I mean I, I'm not a, I'm not a coward you know I do share my faith but you know I miss some opportunities here and then I, and I want to correct that I want to step up so in soul winning, we've got to overcome these obstacles in order to experience this explosive and exciting ministry. How many of you have had the opportunity to lead someone to Christ in your lifetime? You, how many of you thought, that was awesome? That's really exciting. I mean, it's, it's really neat to be able to do that. All right, so let's talk about some obstacles. Obstacle number one, that's not my calling. Or, it could be worded this way, that's not my gift. My gift is this... Or, or this is what I do, or my gift is that. And, and I'd be a fool to say that th there's not truth in that because everybody's not called to be the same thing. We're all not cookie cutters. We've all, the Holy Spirit gives all these various gifts, but we're all different. We're all in different places. But I think what happens is sometimes we can galvanize our position of disobedience by saying, this isn't my gift. And I want to I kind of mess with that ideology for just a minute. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, right around verse 31, it talks about spiritual gifts. And it goes through the five-fold ministries. It goes through some of the charismatas or the different gifts of the Spirit. It talks about prophecy, tongues, healing. It talks about apostles and prophets. And then, and, then, and then the apostle Paul here, as he's inspired by the Holy Spirit, begins to ask a, re a question. He says, are all prophets? Are all apostles? Do all prophesy? Now, he doesn't answer the question, but the rhetorical answer to the question is no. Not everybody's an apostle, not everybody's a prophet, not everybody prophesies, not everybody's an evangelist, not everybody's these things. So, so the, the excused person is like, yeah, amen, that's, pre that's good preaching right there, Pastor Tony. But, but he doesn't stop there, because in verse 31 he says, now eagerly desire the greater gifts. So if you're not an evangelist, you can raise your hand and say, I'm not an evangelist. That's not my gift. But wait a minute. Verse 31 says, eagerly desire the greater gifts. Now, I'm not here to, to rank spiritual gifts this morning, but let me just say this. I believe soul winning has got to be pretty high on God's list of great gifts. The, the evangelistic anointing, or whatever you want to call that, that causes a person to reach out and touch people with the love of Jesus Christ, that has got to be pretty high on God's priority list for gifts. So is this a greater gift? I would say that it is. I believe specifically this passage is really talking about prophecy. But I would also say with that, boy, this soul winning thing is, is something we should desire. You know, I like the King James Version of the Bible here because it uses the word covet. Earnestly covet 
spiritual gifts. So, now here's the question. Are all prophets, are all apostles, are all evangelists? No, they're not. But what should our, should we just build a little fortress around our own personalities and stay that way? Should we just say, this is how I am, this is how God made me, God's through working with me, God's through sanctifying me, God's through building me up and causing me to be effective in various ministries? No, we should leave room for God to be God. Now let me say this too. I believe in, I think gifts tests are good. I think it's good to identify your spiritual gifts. It's good to know what you're good at. And it's good to operate in your strengths. You know, my wife and I are really competitive. And so I heard her saying something to someone the other day. And she said, if I don't think there's a chance I'm going to win, I'm not even going to start. Because I want to win. So we, we've got this desire to be successful. We want to we operate in our strengths. But at the same time, I think it's wise to leave room for God to develop us. How many of you are a better Christian today than you were 10 years ago? There's more dimensions to the Christ-likeness in you. There's a greater expression of Jesus coming through your life. There's greater revelation. There's greater levels of obedience. All these things begin to develop. So the gifts test sometimes can, can excuse me, the gifts test sometimes can put us into a box and say, nope, that's not my gift. That's not my gift. But I'm here to tell you, desire the greater gifts. You may be, your, your primary gift may be hospitality. I mean, people, people may come into your home and it, and it just feels like a warm blanket just comes over their shoulders. It, it, it's just so, it's like, it's just awesome. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You get around somebody that's got that hospitality gifting, it's incredible, man. It's so awesome. It's neat. And you may be sitting here today and say, man, that's my gift is hospitality. Well, great. Praise God. Have people come over to your house. Express that hospitality. Serve them. Care for them. Love them. Feed them. I mean, show them, hand them the remote to the TV. I mean, just be so hospitable. It's unbelievable. And then guess what happens? Their heart is so open to you because you're so nice and you can share the gospel. So all the gifts work together, but could there be a greater gift than being the tip of the spear? Now, now there was an expression that uh, I think some of the commentary people were using on the, one of the news networks when we went into some uh, war zone. And they were talking about the Marines went in first, or, or one, of the, one of the military groups was first, and they were called the tip of the spear. And I think soul winners, in some ways, in the church, are the tip of the spear. Because they go in sometimes, and, and they go in first. And I really believe that the Lord has a high priority on this gift. And a challenging question is, are we eagerly desiring the gift of being a soul winner? Have we been praying this? Have we been asking, God, make me a soul winner. God, use me in this way. I want to be a, a winner of souls. I want to populate heaven and plunder hell. Whoa, man, this is big stuff, you know. All right, 1 John 5, 14 and 15. If we pray according to God's will, we can have confidence. We have, let me just read this, First, verse 14. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. So when we go to God with this request and we say, God, Make me a soul winner. Make me an evangelist. I mean, I'm not saying you're going to, you know, get the evangelist hair. How many of you know have evangelist hair? You know what I'm talking about, the haircut? You know, shoo, the, the swoopy hair. And then, you know, ah, I mean, well, you know, you don't have to necessarily do all that. But I'm saying you become a soul winner. Just because you travel from church to church and, and you know, an itinerant ministry. I'm not talking about becoming a vocational evangelist in the modern church sense. I'm talking about being a soul winner. I'm talking about touching hearts and lives and touching people in your community, touching people you work with and sharing the gospel effectively so they can come to a place of faith. You know, like during the drama, Andrea shared with, uh, with Malcolm. And Malcolm's six years old. And, you know, I mean, it was a drama, but Malcolm could understand that. And he said, hey, yeah, man, I want to live forever. I want eternal life. What do I got to do? Will you pray with me? Will you believe? Yeah, I'll do it. So praise God. Okay, so let me go back. Now, now, here's the thing. Is it God's will for people to be saved? Is it God's will for people to come to Christ? Because we know if we pray according to His will, He hears us. And we know that if He hears us, we'll have whatever we ask. So the question is, is it God's will for people to repent? I think it is. 2 Peter 3.9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you. Now, this is what He wants. He doesn't want anyone to perish but everyone to come to repentance. He wants everyone 
to be in heaven. That's his will. That's what he wants. And so if you pray according to God's will, you can know that he hears you and you will have what you've asked of him. If you pray, God give me the ability and gifting to be a soul winning person, will he do it? Yeah. Yeah, he sure will, according to his word. All right, here's another thing. I believe that God has given the believer the ministry of reconciliation. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was rec- reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Now, I don't know about you, but I didn't use the word reconciliation in a sentence this morning until right here. And, but, but let's talk about what does the word reconcile mean, or, or reconciliation. It means to cause people or groups of people to become friendly again after an argument or disagreement. The, the prophet Isaiah talks about sin separating us from God. It says our sin has separated us from God. And so a person that has not made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ is separated from God. There is an animosity, there's, there's friction, there's not peace with God when a person doesn't know the Lord Jesus. So this ministry of reconciliation that God has given us, is it give, God gives us the ability to connect people back to God. And we can say, hey, lost person, here's God. Why don't you guys have a conversation? Let's work this thing out. Let's, let's reconcile. Let's bring peace into this life, into this relationship. And I believe every Christian has a calling and responsibility to bear fruit for Christ. You know, what is bearing fruit? You know, John chapter 15 talks about bearing fruit. You know, we should be fruitful. We, we should bear fruit. Well, my wife and I, we have borne fruit. We have five children. We have a fruitful marriage by modern standards. You know, if you went back a couple hundred years, we we just getting started, you know, with five kids. That's nothing. So, to me, if Jesus Christ has called us to be fruitful, he's called us to reproduce Christ in us into the world. He's called us to reproduce the Christ that's in us into others. And I believe that can happen in a lot of different ways. But one way I do believe specifically it happens is through soul winning. That you could put your arm around somebody and say, this person is saved because I shared the gospel with them. And here they are on a Sunday morning. I believe that's what God has called us to be fruitful. I want to share with you a story. I, it's kind of funny. It'd be funny if it wasn't true. But there was an important job to be done, and everybody was sure somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but nobody did it. Somebody got angry about that because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought that anybody could do it, but nobody realized that everybody wouldn't do it. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have done. And sometimes in the area of soul winning, this is a this applies because we're kind of looking to someone else to do this. We're looking to other people to take care of this responsibility. And really, I believe it's all of our responsibilities. Now, here's obstacle number two. And this might come across a little hard-hitting, but I think that's okay. You're tough. Obstacle number two is I don't really care that much about others. I just don't really care that much about other people. I care about myself. I care about my family. I care about my stuff. I care about my things. But I really don't care about lost people that much. Now, a good soul winner will be a person that loves and cares for the lost. And I want to I share something with you. I want to open my heart to you this morning a little bit because I'll be honest. I've gone through different levels of compassion when it comes to the lost. You know, I'm a pastor, I think, by five-fold gifting. I believe God's called me to be a pastor, which means I work with the church. I work with believers a lot. But I also believe I have a responsibility as a pastor shepherd to lead. And so I believe in one area that I should lead is in the area of soul winning as an evangelist. I really don't think I'm called to be an evangelist, but I do evangelistic work because I want to be a good example. Because I don't want to, I've heard a lot of pastors say, sheep beget sheep and shepherds beget shepherds. So I don't have any responsibility to do any soul winning. I don't really go for that. I think, I think I need to be the first guy over the hill. I need to be the first guy to wash people's feet, I, you know, as, as the sh- pastor shepherd in this house. And it, it came to my attention by the Holy Spirit that I was really 
not that compassionate toward the lost. I'd kind of lost some of that. I'd, I used to be very tender-hearted. I used to just be broken and weep and cry because I was fresh out of the fire myself. And, it, and I remember what it was like to be in that mess. And I remember what it was like to be in bondage to sin. And I remember what it felt like to get my head out of that vice. And Jesus saving me and delivering me. And, ah, yeah, i got to tell everybody. i got to tell everybody because I know what it's like. I know they're lost. I know they're hurting. I know they're broken. I, I was just one of them. But, you know, over time you know, 15, 20 years, you can get a little detached from that memory. And we had a prayer meeting one Saturday night, and, and I'm going to brag on a friend of mine. We had, we had a man, a minister of the gospel here named Bob Francis. And he came in, and we were praying, and we were sitting around talking. And he began to talk about the lost. And it was just, you know, we were just talking. And all of a sudden, he began to cry. He began to weep. And the Holy Spirit said, why aren't you crying? Why aren't you weeping? And I said, because I'm in sin. So I went to Bob and I said, Bob, will you lay hands on me? Will you pray for me? Because that is what I need. I need that compassion. I, I need to care again. I need to be motivated by love and compassion to share my faith with the lost because they're dying. They're, they're trapped in sin. They're going to hell. They need help. They need life. And I'm, I'm on the boat, if you will. Who was the, the, the booth, the founder of the Salvation Army? He had this vision of a great cruise line. And everybody was on the cruise line. Everyone was playing shuffleboard. And, and then people were talking to the captain. And people were dancing in the ballroom. And it, it was representative of the church. And there were about five or six people that could hear the cries from the ocean. They could hear the people out, Save me! Help me! And they're... They're throwing a lifeline. Can anybody help? Hey, can you help me? Can you help me throw in a lifeline? These people are out here drowning. They're dying. Please stop playing shuffleboard. These people are dying. No, no, we've got to play shuffleboard. Now, I'm not saying that there's not other work to do in the church, because there is. But in the, in the light of all of these things, there's, there should be a high priority on this. Jesus in Matthew 9.36 saw the crowds and he had compassion because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. They were, to use modern vernacular, they were clueless. They didn't, know what, they didn't know what was going on. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know where to go. They didn't have any clue about life. And Jesus saw them and he went, wow. He could have just looked at them and said, oh, you guys are losers. But he didn't do that. He was, had compassion, and he cared. Ephesians 2.12 tells us to remember that at that, that time, when we were lost, we were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope, and without God in the world. And I want to challenge you this morning and ask you, can you love people more than you are afraid to share with them? Can you let that compassion rise up in your heart to where it trumps your fear? Can you let the compassion overcome the obstacles? You can, I don't think this is humanly possible, but I think when God speaks to our hearts and we get this revelation, I think we'll step out and become obedient. I believe we should ask God to give us His heart for the lost. He will do it. Do you remember what it was like to be lost? Without hope? Without God? Some of you are nodding yes. Some of you are looking at me like a deer in the headlights. But praise God, I remember. And, and I want to I be filled with compassion. All right, let's talk about our last obstacle. And this one will be a little easier to manage. I don't know what to say. I just don't know what to say to people. I don't know how to, I don't know how to do this. Well, let's talk about it. Now, having some rudimentary training and sharing the gospel with some diagnostic questions goes a long way to start the conversation. And what do I mean by that? I mean... Memorizing a script. Now let me say this. If you can't memorize or you have a hard time memorizing, do it anyway. It's worth it. I have, I have another good friend that he, he, he likes to share the gospel when he's preaching and he, and, he, and he got frustrated one day and he said, if you're not sharing your faith, you're going to go to hell. Now can I tell you something? I don't believe that for one second. I don't think that's true. I don't think we have to earn our salvation by sharing our faith. 
But let me say this. Somebody else might go to hell. Now you won't. You're saved. I believe our salvation is secure. But somebody else might go to hell if you disobey. Oh, wow, that's, that's serious. The soul winning script I used took me two hours to memorize. Now, I may have a great memory or something. You can ask my wife, that's probably not true. I probably don't have a great memory. But it became important to me because I didn't want people to go to hell. I wanted people to have an opportunity to hear the gospel. Now, the soul winning script that we use, I have to read over from time to time to refresh my memory. But I think it's time well invested. I mean, you know, I watched a football game yesterday. I spent a good two hours watching a football game. I watched, was it Texas A&M and uh, Alabama? No, it wasn't Alabama. Auburn. Yeah, and Auburn won. Auburn beat Johnny Football, man. He got hurt, hurt his shoulder and all that. I spent hours watching that, thinking about it. And, and, whoa, man, look at this quarterback. Man, he's agile. He's mobile. He's a Heisman Trophy winner. And, eh. Can I tell you, as much as I enjoy football, in the grand scheme of things, it means nothing. I hear a lot of amens from the women, but men, come on. Now, I like athletics. I'm an athletic person. I think you learn th- your character, character development and all that. But really, in the grand scheme of things, no one's going to get saved watching football. No one's going to get discipled. No one's going to grow in their faith. No one's going to shake the nations for Jesus because they watch a ball game. I'm meddling, I know. Now, when you're talking to people, let me give you a way out. Let's say, let's say you're, you're terrified because you don't know enough. Well, newsflash, nobody knows enough. I mean, how much is there to know? Yeah, I mean, you could know. You know, I don't know enough. Because, I mean, I'm, I'm, I get questions sometimes. I get people to say things. I just think, man, oh, man, that's weird. I don't know. I don't know what to say to that, you know. Have a good day. I'll say that. And what you can also say is, I don't know, but if you really want to know, I'll find out and get back to you on that. I'll give you some answers. I'll give you some possibilities. And uh, the answer, I don't know, is a great answer. It's been said that he who asks the questions controls the conversation. And in the soul winning script that we use, we ask a lot of questions. But you're never going to know everything. And getting started now will help you get the on-the-job training that will allow you to train others. Now, soul winning is better caught than taught. Let me tell you what's going to happen as a result of me sharing this message today with you. From my experience, nothing. I can preach and preach and preach soul winning, and no one goes, goes and does it. So let's just get that out in the open. But what's the, so what's the point, Pastor? What do you waste all our time for then if, if you're not going to see any results from this? Well, I'm looking for a few good men. I'm looking for a few good women that will say, I'm going to go with you. I'm going to catch this thing. I'm going to understand. I'm going to learn how to do this. I, wanna, I want you to t- put me under your wing, and I want you to take me out, and I want you to show me how to do this. I want to catch this spirit. Because really talking about it on Sunday morning, this is really my effort to recruit people to go with me and Miss Shirley, and Tim, and Joe, and Janet, and others that, are, that have taken on this ministry. Because what can happen is an explosion. This, this ministry, and again, let me, let, me, let me do justice to the rest of the body of Christ and the rest of the... There are a lot of things, a lot of good things in the body of Christ besides soul winning. I've, I've been around evangelists, and man, they preach an evangelistic message, and if you're not winning souls, you just feel like pond scum. You know, you just, you're just, you're just a, a scumbag. But no, don't, don't feel that way. Realize there are a lot of things going on in the body of Christ, but this is, is critical. And, and what I mean, but let's just think about this for a minute. Let's just say, in the human race, no one could have children anymore. That was it. What happens? Well, the clock starts ticking on the extermination of the human race. And, 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 you know, there's a baby that's born today that may live to be 120. And at the end of 120 years, there will be no more human beings on planet Earth. Because we'll all die. There won't be anyone to replace us. So soul winning is a lot like birth. It's like a spiritual birth. And so... In the body of Christ today, we see churches grow and churches shrink. And this church has a disagreement, and, and the people leave and they go to this church. And this shuffles here and they shuffle there. And they, you know, 
And hey, you know, we welcome everybody here. But if the body of Christ as a whole is not reaching the lost, the church is dying. And when you look at the statistics and you look at the real numbers nationwide, the Church of America is failing the American culture. Now, that's not to say there aren't pockets of spiritual life in different places in America. But, but hey, I can't deal with all that. I just got to deal with this. I got to deal with me and I got to deal with you. Let's, let's get to work here and let's be about the Father's business. Let's be about the Master's business. So in conclusion, we have to remember that when the church is only shuffling members from one church to another, it's not really growing. We have to be about the business of soul winning if we're to see the kingdom of God truly expand and hell plundered. Now let's agree today with God and pray for the Lord to send out workers into his harvest field. God, give us the desire, compassion, and discipline to get the knowledge we need to be effective soul winners for your glory. And I want to conclude with a word of prayer with you. And I want you to agree with me. And I want to pray this prayer. God, send out laborers into the harvest field. You know one thing I know about people? They always do what's important to them. Always. We always do what's important to us. I mean, it's that simple. A lot of people come all week long asking for food. Pastor Tony, can your church feed us? I say, yes, we sure can. And I'll say, hey, I would love to see you on a Sunday morning. Come and worship with us. And they say, oh, I can't make it to church. And I look at them and I say, wow, are you magical? How did you get here today? Did you teleport here today? You made it. It's, it's a miracle. Hey, let's ride. Let's call up the Batesville Guard. We've had a miracle. They got to church somehow. Well, they got there that day because natural food was more important to them than spiritual food. I mean, no, it's simple. So we always make time. We always prioritize what's most important to us. How many of you think that maybe, just maybe, some of our priorities could use a little adjusting by the Holy Spirit? And I'm not here to be condescending or condemning, but, but let's just be real. I needed that. I, I still need that. I, I could still improve. I want to be better. I want to be more compassionate. I want to be moved with love and, and compassion and be motivated by the Spirit of God to be obedient and do what God's called me to do. But let's face it, if we don't win souls... The clock is ticking on our death, on our existence. This is critical. Now look, we're in good shape. But how do you want to be in better shape? Father, in Jesus' name, we agree with your word that's forever settled in heaven. It will never pass away. And we cry out to the Lord of the harvest and we say, send out laborers into the harvest field. Send them out, God. Send out visitors. Send out soul winners. Send out evangelists. Send out people with clothed with compassion, clothed with knowledge that will just go out and overcome their fears and overcome their, their priorities and just make a decision. Yes, yes, I'm going to be a soul winner. I want to see someone get saved. I want God to use me. And this morning, God, in Jesus' name, Lord, we thank you for this prayer. And Lord, we thank you for the fleshing out of this reality that you'll raise us up and use us in this area. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's give the Lord praise this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. I want to pray over the meal. Are we ready to eat? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Praise God. Yeah, it's important to us, isn't it? That food. Lord, we thank you for this food. Lord, we thank you for every person that worked to cook and prepare. And Lord, we thank you for blessing our fellowship time together. In Jesus' name, amen.